Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Down the Drain, Catch Basin Protection, presented by Pacific Northwest Chapter of the International Erosion Control Association. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm David Jenkins, the uh, past erosion control stormwater engineer for the Port of Seattle, uh, currently retired, but uh, continue on as president of the Pacific Northwest Chapter. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to our chapter YouTube site. And with that, again, welcome. Um, and let's get started. First, uh, some shameless self-promotion. So we do have several online, uh, online sites for the chapter. Uh, we have the chapter website at pnwciec.org where you can connect up with future events. You can look into joining the, cha the chapter through the International Association. You can also link to our LinkedIn site and YouTube site. Here's the YouTube site. We currently have nine presentations uploaded and uh, this will make number 10. We're trying to do these presentations at least once a month, sometimes two, and uh, they're just on various topics of, of interest uh, to us erosion control nerds. If you have any ideas, anything that you would like to see presented, please just put it in the chat and we'll see what we can do. Also, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and depending on how many people attend, if we have a pretty low turnout, I might just open it up and have everybody unmute and we can just uh, share back and forth. I don't know why I'm losing my voice here. And here's the LinkedIn site. I imagine most of you came in through here anyway. Okay, with that, uh, why protect catch basins? So first of all, catch basins drain uh, to, to somewhere you don't want dirty water going. So either directly to a stream, to a uh, creek, some water of the state, Puget Sound somewhere. So they, on a construction project, it's critical they be protected. What are you protecting from? Uh, in the state of Washington, construction stormwater discharges are regulated for turbidity rather than sediment or other such things. So I'm really gonna focus on turbidity because that's kind of the biggest issue. Uh, but with turbidity, by preventing turbidity, you're also preventing sediment discharge. You probably have all seen some form of this little chart. It was put together by a friend of mine at Water Tectonics. Um, but I just wanted to point out that, first of all, a catch basin insert, which I'll talk quite a bit about, uh, which is one of the main devices used for protecting catch basins in construction. Uh, it is a sediment control device. And if you look on the right of this chart, you see that sediment control devices are great for um, removing sand or preventing sand from leaving a construction site. So that would include silt fence, um, sediment ponds, things like that. It is possible to get down into the fine sands with them, but not too far down into them. And then with filtration, which many of the catch basin protection devices rely on some sort of, some, some sort of passive filtration, um, you, can, you can get some of the fine sand out and possibly down into the larger silt particles. But anything smaller than that, you're not gonna get. And uh, that's the cause of turbidity, the clays, the colloidal particles, and the fine silts give you an example of that. And if you've seen any of my presentations, you've probably seen this before, but uh, this is a, uh, I think a pretty graphic representation. So this stockpile over here is bare on top because we continue to bring soil in. Um, and then everything drains eventually to this long thin stormwater pond. So a couple samples were taken uh, as water is traveling from the stockpile to the stormwater pond. The sample on the left was taken uh, of runoff from the top of the pile, and the sample on the right is the water that's going into, uh, or excuse me, exiting the stormwater pond. So two things you'll notice, uh, the settleable 
material on the bottom, there's a significant reduction between the left and the right samples. Um, that is the sand and you know, coarse and probably fine sand, maybe a little silt. So a significant reduction. The um, turbidity, however, in the water column here, there is not much difference. The turbidity on the left sample is probably in the upper 100 MTUs, which would be the measure. And then on the right is probably in the low to mid 100s. So the one on the right would get you close to complying with uh, Washington state discharge requirement, but you would still have to do some kind of additional BMPs to, to uh, satisfy the requirements. At the Port of Seattle, where these pic a lot of these pictures are taken, where I worked for 22 years, uh, the discharge from a construction site because of the permit system at, at SeaTac Airport in particular, uh, discharges have to meet 25 NTUs or less. So none of these would even come close to meeting that discharge requirement. So how do you protect catch basins? Well, if go way back, old school, uh, straw bale sitting on top of a catch basin, I suppose. Not, not that it's recommended, but I thought it was kind of amusing. And before I get into uh, the guts of this thing, most of the catch basins I'm gonna talk about are standard type. There are other devices that you might have to deal with like uh, trench drains, slot drains, uh, things like that. So you have to be creative with these. Um, and I'll just, one of the, one of the things that we have found is placing geotextile fabric over the entire thing, like from concrete edge to concrete edge full length, covering it with asphalt. So you keep everything out, uh, but you have to be creative with these kinds of things. And like deck drains on seaport projects where we have container terminals, there's a million of these three or four inch pipes that drain directly to Elliott Bay. Um, so we either have to put fabric in them and then fill them with um, spray foam or fabric and a tennis ball. So you have to just be creative with these. All right, so the several types of protection measures, there's the above grate. So here's a really old school detail showing gravel on wire mesh sitting on top of a catch basin showing the filtered water. Um, and based on that diagram showing settling times for different size particles, this might get you very coarse sand removal, but not much else. Um, hopefully these aren't used anymore, but it does represent a type. Here's one that is um, used quite a bit on highway projects, for example. So above grade using silt fence fabric, T posts and things like that. Now these can work um, if they're installed well and properly, but notice the overlap of the fabric. If that isn't done very well or extremely well, you're gonna get leakage through there anyway. But if these are done correctly, potentially you can get water all the way up to the top and overflow. So you always have to think about flooding when you're using an above grate uh, protection device. Now, a uh, question might come up about filtration or water passing through this fabric. Silt fence fabric uh, does not pass sediment laden water very quickly and will eventually plug up so it becomes a barrier. So can't really re rely on filtration. And here's a manufactured device, same idea. Um, you lift the grate off, set this in place and put the grate over the top. So water on this one, actually, this is a more coarse mesh material. So it does pass water a little more quickly than silt fence fabric, but it, it will also plug up. Uh, and then, then these are reusable, so they're kind of cool, but note the flooding. And then the below grate types of devices, which you're probably all familiar with. So this is one that um, is used mostly, I think. And you can see uh, provides a pocket for sediment to settle out and then some overflow um, holes. It does show water flowing through, uh, but it's the same thing I just, just mentioned. Any type of geotextile fabric, unless it's a really open weave, which might catch gravel, 
um, if it's it's if it's a small mesh, a small really tight mesh, it's not going to flow water very quickly or for very long. So you're really looking at pond uh, ponding and settling. So I, this is kind of amusing. This is putting one in. Well, I don't know why two people. Probably takes two or three people to get them out once they're fill, filled with sediment. Another type of below grate is the one that is that actually sets inside so there is no flap and there's advantages to this over the other one which i think i have pictures of so let's just take the grate off set it in place and then put the grate back on and then there's berm you can berm around grates to keep water from going in but like any above grate measure there is going to be flooding that you'll have to deal with and i'm going to give examples of all of this as we go and what to do about these things. So first one was asphalt. Here's a straw waddle around a, a non-standard catch basin at SeaTac Airport, which also has probably plastic in there, some geotextile, because we can't really have anything go into them during construction. Uh, same idea, this is in the construction site, so absolutely nothing gets in the catch basin. And then the straw wattle keeps gross sediment from uh, getting on top of the catch base and makes it harder to clean out. This one is a compost sock and it's used not to keep stuff from leaving the project to the top, but from keep, uh, keeping clean water from going into the project. So another thing to keep in mind that, uh, you know, catch basins are great for, for what they're designed for clean water and very low sediment load. And then you can block grate. Now I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on this one because I find this one of the more useful ones. Um, a lot of jurisdictions don't allow this, um, but if you, well, I'll go into it. I think, they're, I think it's a great way to go, but again, it's gonna cause flooding. So why would I want to completely block a catch basin grate? because construction is messy. Uh, there's no getting around it. As clean as you keep a construction site, it's still gonna be messy in many cases. So here's just a few examples of those. Oh, by the way, this is one of the downsides to the uh, catch basin sock that has the flaps. You can see the flaps will fold over and almost completely cover the catch basin grate. They can also be a trip hazard. Uh, stockpiles, dirty. Another reason to, here's the, one of the main reasons to block a catch basin grate. Um, this happens to be 30 mil PVC fabric, polyvinyl chloride, uh, which is what I would recommend if you're going to do this. It's a real heavy duty plastic material. Um, so again, flooding, any of these types of methods are gonna cause flooding, which you'll have to figure out how to deal with and I'll show you how. Uh, one of the downsides to completely blocking a grate is somebody's gonna get tired of walking through water and they're gonna poke holes in it. So if you do this, you have to be clear with everybody on site that this is on purpose and you're not to punch holes in it. So um, this happens a lot. Okay, so um, this project is pretty much all asphalt, although it is being removed and replaced, but at this stage, um, it's mostly asphalt sweeping all the time and you can still see turbid water going to the catch basin. This one is blocked temporarily, uh, but the next phase of construction is to actually remove grind and remove asphalt. Um, but in places, the asphalt was left in place so that when we had that catch basin completely sealed, then everything infiltrated. So, uh, so that's one way to take care of water the flooding if you do the uh, complete block of a catch basin grate is figure out some infiltration, which here's another example is just removing asphalt, filling with three to five inch rock so you can drive over it blocking the catch basin and, and letting uh, water slowly infiltrate. 
And here's a pretty graphic example. I think this was 24 hours, actually. I can't remember exactly. So those are some different methods. Uh, and uh, well, let me open it up. We don't have too many folks. If you want to unmute, if you have any questions uh, before we move on to a lot of small detail things. Comments are good too. Okay, well, let's move on. Uh, this obviously is the result of a catch basin not being protected somehow. So another thing to consider, uh, especially if you have a lot of water to deal with is to plug and pump. So not don't block the catch basin, but plug it, plug the pipe, the discharge pipe and use it as a sump for pumping. So in this case, until the grass is established, uh, we have plugged this manhole and we're pumping up to tanks, then using the water for probably uh, dust control. Now, a couple things about, three things about plugs. Uh, this is the standard popular method for plugging pipes and that it's a uh, an air, um, well, I call them pigs. So it's an air pig. Um, you inflate it, they come in different sizes to accommodate different pipes. But they, they're problematic because they get scuffed up and they leak. Um, and people don't check them, they stick them in there and then they walk. So you, if you use an air plug, you have to check it continually to make sure it's not leaking. Uh, and deflating and discharging because if you're plugging a storm uh, storm system to use a manhole for a sump to pump from, um, the water is assumed to be dirty, so you don't want any leakage. Um, at the Port of Seattle, our uh, specified requirement is if you use an air plug, you can only use it for 24 hours because we had so many problems with this thing, these things failing and uh, water discharging. So, um, so we really limit the use of these. The next option that we have is a mechanical plug and uh, we allow them to be used for two to five days. These work great, but they're really meant for, for temporary, at least I think they're meant for temporary. Um, they, do, they can fail if they're not installed properly or if you gotta, don't have a good uh, consistent pipe surface to attach to. In fact, we had a, it's at least a 24 inch mechanical plug, possibly 36 inch um, on the outlet of a big stormwater pond we were using for collecting dirty turbid water uh, to, to be treated chemically. And the mechanical plug failed and we drained over a million gallons of extremely muddy water out into a wetland and nobody was real happy about that. So, so again, we've had failures, so we limit the use of these. And then lastly, if, if pipes are gonna be plugged so that we can use a uh, manhole as a sump, we brick them, we brick the pipes and fill them with mortar. Um, our standard is the mortar has to be um, one and a half times the diameter of the pipe the thickness of it or the length of it, one and a half times the diameter of the pipe uh, to stay in place. The contractors don't like it, especially because then they have to send somebody down and ship it out. But it's this is the one that's proven to last the best. Um, I don't recommend doing it this way. But so that's, uh, that's how we do plugs at Port of Seattle. And then, you know, again, use use a manhole or catch basin as a sump to move water around. In order to do this effectively, you really need to know how the storm system works. Um, you need to know if you're on an and catch basin or if you're in a through catch basin. So at the top here, at the top of this picture, you can see on the top left or top center is an end catch basin, which you would just have to plug the outlet to, to use, uh, use this as a sump. The next one in line to the right is a through catch basin. Um, 
So you have to think about if you plug the outlet of that catch basin, you're taking clean, maybe not clean, you're taking water from the end one and water going into this one. Um, so you have to take that into consideration for pump sizing, things like that. All the way to, you see the discharge to the right, if you plug that, then you're taking all the water and you have to have large enough pump and a discharge location. So in this case, uh, most of the, the, the blue system, most of it is gonna be clean because it's roof drainage mostly. Uh, but when this building is demolished, then potentially it's all dirty. So all of these connections to the system from the roof drains have to be plugged. So you need to really be aware of what the system uh, looks like and how it functions. Another example of that, the systems can be complicated, overlaps, additions done over the years. Um, if it's an old system, it may not be correctly identified on uh, a GIS layer. So you might have to do some field recon to verify. In this case, we uh, demolished the building to the right, the long narrow, and we were able to plug one catch basin, and I can't remember which one it was. Um, and collect all the site water during construction, treat it for pH, and then discharge to a different catch basin um, to the creek. So, so it can be a very effective way to manage construction stormwater. And actually in that case, we, aside from plugging one catch basin outlet, not the, not the grate, but the actual pipe outlet, uh, we didn't protect any of the other catch basins. I don't think we even used socks in them. Uh, we might have, but yeah, I, I don't think we did. So here's an example, big project out at SeaTac uh, a number of years ago, where we were collecting as much water from the project, several hundred acres, and, and running it to a treatment system. Um, and this is an area where we had to, um, if we had let the water go, and not pump it, it would have gone to a different drainage system and, uh, and would not have made it to the treatment. So we had to mud up the outlet pipe on this manhole where the pump is set up and then pump over to this other manhole, which did go to the treatment system. So same, same idea, um, really investigating the storm system is a, a good idea. Um, other things to do, is to, you can set a catch basin box and, you know, without pipes attached yet and use it as a sump to collect water. And then it, if you have a place to discharge to even better. So in this case, it's perforated pipe over grass. But you can do the same thing, even if you're not using a sump, um, if you block the catch basin grate completely and you're ponding, then you could set up a trash pump or something and do the, the same thing here. Okay, so we still don't have a lot of folks here. If anybody has any questions, you can unmute. Um, if I've allowed that, I think I have, um, and ask any questions. Or again, just leave some, something in the chat and I'll pick it up. We can answer as we go or wait till the end. Also, if you have any ideas for presentations you'd like to see, please put in the chat or any comments. What is it, questions, comments, or concerns? Uh, and for the, those of you that didn't come in first thing, uh, please investigate our chapter website at pnwciieca.org. So you can stay up on future events. And you can also connect to our YouTube channel as we record all of these presentations and put them on our channel. Hey, okay. Dave. Yes, sir. You, this is Troy. Uh, usually when using those bag plugs, I've found that uh, just a comment here. I found that uh, having the contractor string their um, regulators that are, you know, so that they can check their air levels, uh, make sure that those are sticking outside of the, the grate or whatever, so that they, they can be monitored not only by the company, but by us, because we've, we've had some problems with that in the past where they, you know, you can't be climbing down in the hole to do that regulation or to, to, to check on those. So, uh, it's also a good idea to have them string those from the plug up to the outside where both, uh, well, in my case, the port can 
take a look at it and make sure it's in compliance and still aired up and it's easy for the contractor to do so as well. So. Cool. Thanks, Troy. And um, I'd like to introduce Trey Modi. He took over my position when I retired from the port. So he gets to do all the fun stuff. Um, and actually, thanks for saying that, Troy. You reminded me. If with any kind of plug, if you're if you're plugging uh, with any kind of plug um, in this in the storm system, how do you know if it's leaking or not? Then because you're investigating how the storm system works, you know the next manhole down the line, and, and you would take your sample there either visually or uh, do a you know dip it and and test it for turbidity to make sure that. The plug's not leaking, and whether it's a mechanical, mechanical or air, or even concrete, they um, can leak occasionally. So inspecting, um, I, I want to just point out um, this sediment going here, and this is just my opinion, um, and it ha and it has to do with any sediment control device on a construction project. My opinion again, if you have sediment building up in or behind a sediment control device, um, you've got a site management issue. And especially with these, because catch basins are so critical uh, due to the fact that they drain somewhere. Um, if you have sediment like this showing, you need to check right away what the source is and get it fixed. And it could be a track out on the road. Um, it could be something that's, um, bypassing or getting under or through silt fence or whatever. But this is bad. And if, if you think about this is the uh, sand and, and stuff, uh, think of all of the turbidity, the water or the fine colloidal particles in the water that have gone down the drain. So just don't let this happen. I mean, I, I, I just, um, catch basin socks should not ever have sediment in them um, in a perfect world. And uh, that's, that's kind of how I always looked at it um, when I worked at the port. Anyway, that's my rant. So for example, you come up on a catch basin and you see all this and you can tell it's been happening a long time. Um, so what's causing this? Oh, stockpiles uncovered. Hmm. So what, it, you know, it, what's, the, what's the issue that we need a sock in here? No, the issue is we need to prevent stuff from getting there in the first place. Okay, I think that's the end of my rant. Um, catch basins need to pre be protected for the entire duration of a project. So let's say your building work is done, you know, all your heavy civil work is done and everything is beautiful. And then the landscapers come in and they do their work and they turn on their uh, irrigation system for the first time and oops, something's not connected properly or something breaks loose. And you can see what happened. A lot of turbid water went down the drain here. So just keep that in mind that you're not done when the civil work is done. Um, you're done when the site is complete and turned over. Always question to, uh, on a project whether a system is live or not. Is this just being set and not connected? Is it connected on, to a live system on the other side? Um, and this happens pretty frequently. Something will be added and it is connected. And this becomes just a major source of dirty water going into going down the drain. Um, this steel plate here, you may have seen these before. So what is, what is that covering? It's covering a catch basin. And uh, is it protecting it? Well, it's protecting it from gravel, but it's not uh, protecting it from turbid water or even sand or silt. So just be aware of things like this when you're inspecting um, that something like this needs to be completely blocked or the, again, the discharge pipe needs to be plugged and um, set up a pump in it. How about this one? It's got a catch basin sock, which uh, worked really well while we were doing the asphalt grinding. Um, we picked up, we co collected all the asphalt chips that fell into the catch basin, they're in the sock. But you can see that the grade itself is not 
attached to the ring or it's not sealed to the ring. So when the water gets another quarter inch higher, looks like actually in the right corner, it already is water's draining in and bypassing the catch basin insert. So be aware of this, um, this kind of thing. As soon as you grind asphalt down around a catch basin or, um, you know, working around one like this, you're potentially opening up discharge to a live system. For example, like this one, uh, and this illustrates a couple things. Um, once, once a uh, grate is exposed, if it gets bumped, it's going to crack the concrete and you're going to be open. So this is a live system. Uh, so look for these things when you're inspecting and uh, cover them up, get them sealed up, get asphalt down, whatever. So in, in fact, sometimes contractors purposely do this to keep the grade drained when it rains, um, which is good for them, but it's not necessarily good for the environment. So here we have best of both, both worlds, I suppose. Um, I think it's a new, in, yeah, it's a new installation. There's a sock in here, not for water draining into it necessarily, but uh, it's keeping gravel and grit and other stuff out of the system. And, but it is mudded up and, it, and really tight and secure. So if water does build up in the grade um, until it gets to the sock, even if the water's dirty, it's, it's contained. So um, one other thing to keep in mind actually is you should make sure in your contracts or as an inspector or regulator that have the contractor jet or clean out the entire storm system on the project when they're done. Um, even with socks and doing the best, you're probably gonna get sediment and slime and stuff in the system. And when you get your first flush of rain, it's gonna wash it all out, which wouldn't be good. Uh, here's another way to protect catch basins is just don't let site water get into them. So this catch basin here, lower right center, does have a sock in it, so which is you know good. Um, but with a series of asphalt berms, street runoff is directed clean to the catch basin. Site runoff is directed to a sump pump on the right and pump back into the project. Um, always keep your eye open for catch basins on a project. So this is outside of a big housing development. And here's this sad little catch basin sitting there. Uh, with no protection and can't see it in the picture, but this drains to a swale, vegetated swale to the right, uh, which belongs to somebody else actually, it belongs to a post office. So, excuse me, so uh, not a good situation. So what do you do about it? This one probably has to be blocked and pumped, which it, actually they eventually did. Uh, I drive by this occasionally. So why did I put this in there? I think this was to re reiterate, if there's sediment getting down to the catch basin, you have a site problem that needs to be identified and fixed. Uh, another way to protect, so picture on the left, this is connecting a new storm system to an existing manhole at the bottom. Um, fortunately, it's summer work, but the contractor did cover the, the trench until they could get asphalt down so that they didn't have stuff draining down into the live system. Um, they could have actually, theoretically, I guess, they could have completely covered the catch basin with plastic and let clean water drain down to the next, next one in line if that was possible. And I think this is the last one. Just always remember when you install something, uh, any type of storm device on a, on any system, but especially on a live system, get it mudded up immediately. So every nook and cranny and crack and pick hole and uh, connection between rings and bricks and everything else, get the mud down uh, as quick as you can so that they don't become sources of dirty water going into the system. And that's all I got. Um, so any questions, go ahead and unmute if you want, if you have any questions or comments.
I will take that as a no. Um, oh, wait a minute. Got something in the chat here. Thank you. You're welcome, Troy. Um, if you have, if you do think of something after, let me go back to the last slide here, if I can do it. Yeah, there we go. Um, you can email me at pnwciecea. Oh, that's incorrect. It's pnwieca info at gmail.com. So Pacific Northwest IECA info at gmail.com. Uh, with that, I want to thank you all for attending and sticking with it. And um, the next official Lunch and Learn is scheduled for, I think, January 26th, the subject to be determined. Again, if you think of anything that you would like to have us do, um, either email me or put it in the chat really quick because I'm going to close it here. So thanks again, and I hope you guys have a good week and good holiday coming up and, uh, and a happy new year. Thank you.